welcome to Solosaurus, a podcast about one-player board and card games. My name is Brandon Waite. And my name is Will Hedrick. And as you can already tell, this episode is a little bit different. This is one of our extra sodes that we play on the off weeks when we don't normally have a new episode out. And Carter is not here for this one. Instead, I'm joined by our friend, Will Hedrick. Will is a friend of ours that we've known for about nine years now, and we have played games with multiplayer games for quite a while now. A long time. A long time. But fewer games recently because life gets busy. Yeah, you have kids. We all have full-time jobs. It was a lot easier during school. Yeah, it was. So tell us how you got into games. In college, it was, I mean, it was the usual stuff. I started playing Catan and then I played a lot of just, you know, general games growing up. But once the whole strategy game genre was opened up, it was it was just a floodgate. I bought whole bunch of dominion i bought you know just just a lot of the stuff that a lot of people cut their teeth on and then when we got to grad school and there were a lot of people that were interested in games then i feel like that's when we all just kind of kind of fed the fire all of us got into it at the same time i think yeah because we were all desperately searching for anything that would keep us from studying or allow us to decompress oh absolutely. after we were done yeah so will and i have a game group that meets once a month now that's really the only regular time that i play multiplayer games anymore i still game mostly solo but you are not a solo gamer I am not a solo gamer. The sum total of my solo game experience you're you're about to hear about. I know that Brandon has played solo games for a long time because it's something he tells me about. It's something I've never really had any interest in. Games for me are very social. And when I when I have that solo time, I oftentimes just end up logging on and playing computer games with college friends and things like that. But With a lot of really just listening to y'all doing the podcast, I ended up with a copy of a game and thought, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to give this a try. Actually, the game that we're going to be talking about in just a little bit is new to Will's collection. But actually, he's had solo games in his collection for some time. He just, to his shame, has never played them solo. I didn't even know they had solo variants. So he doesn't feel shame so he has i don't feel shame for much you (laughs) know that he has caverna and lahav and a few others that can be played solo but he's a good stand-in for carter here because like carter will doesn't play solo games regularly he brings that kind of different perspective i play them all the time you would need to be really impressed with a game to play it solo oh i would need to be yeah yeah well that's good because the game that we're talking about today is one that a lot of people have been very interested in for solo play i think and one that is a good fit for people who may be new to solo games in general the game that we're going to be talking about today is star realms frontiers now if you are new to star realms this can be a little bit confusing because there's a whole lot out there that has the star realms name on it so this is actually the third standalone set of Star Realms that exists. Yeah, and then there's a lot of different little expansion packs and things like that as well. Yeah, which just make it even more confusing. Uh, so the original game is Star Realms, period. There's just no, Star Realms. Just Star Realms. Then there was Star Realms Colony. Which, Colony Wars. Colony Wars, which could be played standalone. And this is a game that was kickstarted last year. This is Star Realms Frontiers. And... What makes this special is that this comes with eight different cooperative scenarios in the box that can all be played solo. So normally Star Realms is a head-to-head deck building game that's not totally unlike Dominion, where you have a starting deck of cards that are pretty weak that give you some trade, which is like the currency of the game, or some violence power. I don't know what it's called. It's just... I think it's just attack points in this game. Yeah, yeah combat, attack. attack, whatever. So you can either do the murder on somebody or you can buy new cards for your deck or both. And normally you would direct any combat attack points that you have against the other player that you're playing with. And your goal is to deplete their authority, which is sort of like their hit points for the game. It's kind of a, a reverse victory point situation. Yeah, you start with yeah. your, your 50 victory points, and then as soon as you can take away somebody's victory points, then then they lose, you win. In this, things are a little bit different, because each of the eight cards that comes in the box that describes a co-op scenario is going to give you some special rules to play with for that scenario. So 
It's a basic deck building game in one sense that's pretty light, comes in a very small box at a very low price point, and I think would be pretty easy for really almost anybody to jump into. I've introduced a lot of people to Star Realms. I I think it's a really easy game to teach and learn. Brandon makes fun of me, though, because my barometer for what's an intro game is is apparently broken. I don't think so. It's it's pretty off, yeah. I I would say that even Dominion is... It's a gateway game, but it takes a little bit for people to wrap their head around. I think it's an easy game to teach. Yeah, well, you know, agree to disagree. So... Just some basic information about Star Realms for those who are interested. Star Realms from Tears is designed by Robert Doherty and Darwin Castle. That's Castle with a K, like Mortal Kombat style. This is from White Wizard Games, and this is a game that was kickstarted in 2017 and actually just arrived to backers, what, two months ago? Uh, It might have been a little bit longer than that, maybe three or four. And you backed this on Kickstarter. I did, yeah. I play some games with my wife. She will play in the large groups almost all the time, but there's very few games that she will play one-on-one with me. And Star Realms is one of the ones. So I I jumped on the opportunity for the asymmetrical starter decks and all of that. The solo modes were just something that happened to catch my attention after the fact. Okay, well, they caught my attention after you told me about them, and I actually have a retail edition of this game. So we can speak to both the Kickstarter experience and the retail experience here, because those are pretty different. In fact, we're just going to jump in right now and start talking about the components for this game. Will, what do you think about the components for Star Realms Frontiers? I think they're cards. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's it. I mean, there, there are no tokens. There are just regular size cards, not Hobbit cards, but like normal playing card size, Dominion size cards. And they feel good. They feel good. They're not, they're not like fancy. They're not linen finished. They're not really stiff, you know, ivory core goodness or anything like that, but they're fine. Yeah, it's clear that the game is built for people who plan on sleeving their cards. They they didn't drop the extra money to go the extra mile on, on the finish, but they made good art. They made the graphic design really clean and easy. I, I As far as all that goes, the, the component stuff is great for me. Yeah, and it has just a classic sci-fi sort of feel. Uh, I say classic. It's a little bit odd in that there are sort of four major factions in the game. I don't know. I always kind of got like a 90s futurist video game vibe. Ooh. The colors really pop. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. The three, three of the four main factions look like they could be in sort of any sci-fi universe. And the fourth is the blob which are sort of organic creatures slash ships they they call them ships in the game but they look like just giant space snakes it's it's clear that some of them are very much just flying worms and goo yeah they're pretty gross looking but i mean the art for them all is very well done absolutely yeah it's not going to blow your mind or anything I, i wouldn't say that but it's very thematic and it does suck you in 90s futurist is a good is a good word for it, I think, or a good phrase for it. The theme is pretty light, I would say. Yeah. It integrates well, it makes sense, but it's not going you're not going to suck you in and feel like you're in a space battle most of the time, I would say. No, but the the one thing I will say is that because you have the different factions, each faction does play well into its theme. Right. The, you're talking about the blob, that they're just murder hobos. They're all about showing up and assimilating, destroying You've got the Federation. They're all about deck control. There's a machine cult group that is really good at, at scrapping, and they're about lean deck play, things like that. And, you know, the idea of the machines kind of streamlining everything inside your deck. The way that the different factions play thematically worked well for me. Yeah, I agree with that. It it does all make sense, and each of those four factions does feel different. They have their own emphases throughout the game. And uh, all that's made very clear by the artwork, the graphic design. I guess the only component that's not a normal size card are the eight scenario cards for the cooperative or solo play, which are just big oversized cards. Yeah, they're bigger than tarot size cards. They're they're real big. They're real big, but they they look nice. They're clear. And the, the box that it comes in is so small and compact. It's like a tiny Epic Galaxies style box. And this is a big box for Star Realms. The normal boxes are, are literally just double size poker deck boxes. This one was, was substantially beefier because the base deck will play one to four, where the other base decks have played just uh, two player. Yeah, that's true. And 
this does bring the solo play, which is unique to this set, but you can mix in those other sets into this one if you want to. Absolutely. So if you want to expand it, it is very expandable. And again, all at a very low price point. So components, I would say, are good, especially for the price. I think the MSRP for this is $19.99, but I paid $14.99 for my copy, which is real cheap in the world of board games. I paid a lot more for that than that on Kickstarter, but that did include a lot of asymmetrical starter decks. And one of the things about Star Realm is it's it's real cheap to get into. The expansions all feel a little pricey, but it's it's one of those things where they do add a lot of value to the game. Yeah, so that's something you can explore if you want to, but the base price is easy to get into. And for the money, I would say you get a fair amount in the box, even though it's just cards. And the rules are pretty good for this game, too. I think in general, the rules for the multiplayer are beautiful. It was where we got into the single player rules that I floundered a bit. Not being a solo gamer, not knowing how much I should invest into learning all the quirks of changing the rules from what I'm used to playing. It's a very familiar game to me. There was a scenario I just gave up on because it just seemed like too many rules. I didn't want to deal with it. I have to say, I had a similar experience. Now, I'm very used to reading solo rules for games, and what I'm used to is a rulebook that has the setup for the multiplayer game at the beginning, multiplayer rules, and then usually a solo setup at the end that changes a little bit from the beginning. It will say, you know, read the setup rules for the normal game and change this, this, and this, which is, by the way, I'm just going to say super annoying in every game that it's ever been in. Just give me a full setup list and a solo section, please. And then there's usually a page or two pages of solo rules that tweak the base game stuff. And it's not that there are a ton of rules for the solo play in this game, because Mm -hmm. it's not that different from multiplayer co-op if you were going to play the co-op mode. Right. But the problem here is that the rules for solo play are spread across three different places. Oh yeah, my my problem was organization. I got so frustrated trying to look and find where the rules for this particular scenario were. Is it on the front of the big card? Is it on the back of the big card? Do I need to flip through the rule book again to the It was one of those things that it was all about how it was organized. Yeah, and what is problematic for me about that is that I don't mind there being some rules text on the big card itself that outlines, you know, the scenario that we're trying to play. I don't mind that at all, as long as it's a recap of what's already in the rule book. Each scenario in the rule book gets its own specific solo rules, and there's also a generic sort of solo rules section before that. So you have the bones of how solo play works in the rule book, and then you get some specific scenario rules in the book. But they're missing things there that are then added on the card itself. And so you look through the rule book trying to find an answer to a question you have. And then, oh, no, it's not there. Maybe it's on the front of this solo card. OK, it's not there. I'll pick it up in the middle of play and then flip it over and look at what's on the back. And it's not that it's a huge deal because the rule book is very small. So you can have it on the table in front of you, you know, pretty easy. Absolutely. I, that's how I ended up playing was it was open. The card was next to it. But if you're a designer and you're listening to this, you should never, ever, ever have rules for a game on a card or component like this that aren't also in the rulebook first. The cards are useful to have recap kind of information that is shorthand for you. But for me, I want all the information that I need to look at in one place if I need to look it up. I feel like... I kind of attacked it from the opposite direction. It seemed like there was so much information on the card. It was all I needed. And so I started trying to play and then I realized there's stuff in missing. So then I pulled out the rule book. I flipped through it and I realized, oh, wait, there's there's more stuff in here. But then, yeah, I was constantly cycling between having to look at all three things. And this wasn't in every scenario, particularly for me, it was in the automaton scenario, which I'm sure we'll talk about it specifically. But it was one of those things where, yeah, if everything had been consolidated a little bit cleaner in one spot and then just summed up on those cards, I think it would have been a much more natural play for me. I agree. I'm used to having to look up rules throughout my first game of a of really any solo game because that just takes me a while to wrap my head around the rules and to have them ingrained in me. The problem with this setup is that because the rules are so different for each solo scenario, 
I had that experience multiple times. Every time you play a new scenario, you're going to have that experience where you flip through the rule book and try to figure out what's going on and look at the card and try to figure out the answers there. And it's not the end of the world by any stretch, but it is definitely a bad thing about this game is I wish that all of that had been contained in the rule book. It would have been much easier for me to get my head around and I wouldn't have that first time play experience eight times. Yeah, absolutely. Now that said, after I played my first game of each scenario, it did come to me pretty easily and I was able to click along just like normal and I felt like it all came together pretty well. But the first playthrough, pretty bumpy. And some of the rules text is also a little bit confusing about how you resolve cards. They will tell you to resolve each area of a card and as soon as you resolve it, restart the process. And if you did exactly what the card said, I feel like you would... Just play. You would just end up in an infinite loop. The way it was worded did break the infinite loop, but it was one of those things that it was easy to read it that way. It was really janky. Now, as a person who's played the base game a lot, there were a lot of scenarios where I glanced at the rule book, made sure I knew one or two things. I pulled that card out and I could just play them. There were some scenarios where it just made sense if you already knew how to play Star Realms. But there were other scenarios that the way you had to modify card interactions because you were doing it with an AI, because you were doing it in a situation where maybe you were supposed to make the AI discard a card, but the AI doesn't have a hand. Well, then there's this list of exceptions, but this list of exceptions, you know, may be different in this variant versus that variant. And that was where I got I got bogged down in the rules and and at points, like I said, I didn't even get back out at points. I just reshuffled and started something else. Yeah. And at this point, we've already slipped into play a little bit. So we're just going to head that direction to, to outline how the game actually plays, because once you do get into the rules and you start to give them in their head, the core of this game is actually very simple. If you've never played a deck building game, the idea is you're going to start with a very weak sort of basic deck and over time. You're going to use your starting cards to buy new and better cards and add them to your deck. And every round, you're going to pull five cards, use what you've got to buy more cards or do the murder against the the baddie for that scenario. And then you're going to discard your cards. And when your deck is empty, you're going to take all the new cards that you bought along with your starters and you're going to shuffle them all together. And now you've got a new, stronger deck to deal with. And that's a cool basic idea, but then... Like Dominion, which is sort of the granddaddy of this whole genre, you have some really interesting things sort of thrown into the works here. You have cards that will, you know, give you more attack power or cards that will give you more buying power. So you can buy more and more cards over the course of the game. But then you have cards that let you trash things or in this game, they're called scrapping. Them. Yeah. And this is a way to get rid of cards from your deck. And if you've never played a deck builder before, the first time you play this the concept of permanently removing a card from your deck doesn't seem like a good idea. It is one of those things that, yeah, you've got to you got to wrap your head around the fact that you're you're looping this deck over and over, and the the faster you can make those loops with more powerful cards, the more powerful your deck becomes. So running a running a lean strong deck you're going to be pulling lots of really strong cards in that five card draw instead of just it being full of garbage that you started the game with. And so that means then that one of the strategies you can have for this game is just to buy a bunch of cool and powerful cards and put them in your deck and just deal with the fact that you're going to have to pull lots of cards that aren't great on your turn. And you can just live with that because eventually you'll get to the cards you you bought that are really big and powerful. Or you can sort of balance those big and powerful cards with cards that let you get rid of other cards from your deck so that you're cycling through it much faster and you have a nice lean deck and both of are viable strategies. Absolutely. I will say having played a lot of rounds of Star Realms, there's only one of the four factions that gives you the ability to scrap cards. And oftentimes whoever gets the ability, I would say 85% of the time in my personal games played, Whoever gets access to a lot of scrapping first, if they get more than the other player, it doesn't kind of balance, they win the game in the end. There are other ways to win, though, that are pretty interesting. I oh, think yeah. that are, even though it's it's definitely a very powerful strategy, you know, there are other cards in here that I think this is pretty cool. They will 
let you permanently scrap them for like a one time really powerful ability. And that's a newer thing in this particular box. Some of those cards that have self scrapping mechanics for just a, a big thing. They they changed how some of that works. There have always been uh, some trashing, some self trashing mechanics for for one big payout, but they put more of that into the link system that's in this game, and that's something we haven't really talked about at all yet. No, not yet. And actually, it's it's a good time to mention it now. So those four factions that you have in the game, the cards that you're buying over the course of the game, they all belong, or almost all of them belong to one of those four factions, and. That means then that when you play down a card, you get its primary ability no matter what. You just play it immediately. Yeah. But there are some cards that have a secondary ability that can trigger if you also that same round play a card of the type that's indicated or two cards of the type that's indicated. You'll get an extra ability after you've already played your primary ability. Yeah, and one of the things that those links kind of interact and change from the the order of play of some other deck building games that I've played is, you know, in something like Dominion, you resolve a card from top to bottom and then you're kind of done with that card. But in Frontiers, you can play down a card and you may not have that link ability yet. And then later on, you'll play down another card and that'll cause that link. So you have to kind of go back to the initial card. As you play Star Realms, you kind of have to think of everything you put down to the table as going into kind of pools of economy rather than them being kind of single cards that once you resolve them, they're done. You kind of put all your cash into a pool, and then at any point in your turn, you can buy. There's not a distinct buy phase. At any point in your turn, you can attack with kind of that all those attack points that you've accrued from all your different cards. And there may be reasons you want to buy first, attack first, things like that. But those turn kind of sections aren't broken up in Star Realms the way they are in some other games. Which took me a couple of rounds of Star Realms to wrap my brain around uh, because I'm used to things being very rigid and when you can and can't. And in Star Realms, it's very fluid when you can and can't. As you play down a card, whatever the initial, if there's initial text, that has to happen as you play the card. But other than that, everything else kind of just happens when you want it to. Yeah, and this idea of chaining different kinds of cards together... You know, you want to focus on two or three, maybe, at the most, different factions for your deck so that you can get those combos so that everything flows together really nicely and you get more and more actions. But this isn't really new to Star Realms. This has been done before in games like Ascension and Marvel Legendary. Well, really, I guess the whole Legendary system. These This idea that there are a few different kind of factions of cards in any given game and you want to focus on those. But here, it's very lean, and it's very easy to kind of decide from the beginning, okay, I can see the the five different cards that are on offer to buy this turn. There are more blue cards here than red or green. I guess I'll go blue to start with. Everything is open to you, but it's pretty easy to decide a path for yourself. And if you were playing multiplayer, you could say, okay, my opponent's going for these things, so I'll probably go for something else so that my buying options are a little more open. In solo play, you really can go whichever route you want to, assuming that the trade row, which is where these cards come out randomly for you to buy, goes your way. Yeah, there's always an element in the Star Realms of does the trade row go my way? One of the things that that I love about this game is you have to play very adaptively. You're laying out a long-term meta strategy doesn't necessarily work. You got to be ready to change your strategies on the fly because the trade road defines the pace of, of a lot of those decision-making things. But like Brandon was saying, in the solo experience, I did still find that going and just grabbing any cards still really messed with my ability to build a deck that that had a purpose that worked in synergy with itself. I still wanted to focus on probably two primary and maybe a third, but a lot of times I, I really kind of want to focus in on on just two. Yeah, that's what keeps your deck really humming along as the game goes. And I don't want you to hear this and think that there's too much randomness here. If you're the kind of person who doesn't like a lot of luck, the rules do build in one exception to the randomness of the trade row, which is that once every game, you can choose to just get rid of every card in the trade row and put out new cards. Yeah, the mulligan rule was something I did use 
I think I just used it once when I was playing, but it was something I, I did make use of. Yeah, I only used it once as well. And that's out of like nine games at this point. So I think that speaks to the fact that even though this is random, the adaptive play element of this, it becomes sort of natural for you as the game goes by. Even if you're a no luck kind of person, I think you'll still find it enjoyable, the challenge of adapting to the market. And the things that you can get on these cards are pretty cool because not only do you have just like more trade power and more combat and and healing and healing that's the other thing you can actually heal some of your authority which is like your hp in this game and sometimes that's going to be real real nice because some of these solo scenarios hit pretty hard on their turn absolutely and oftentimes you get a little more healing for your for your action economy for for your value on the card than you would get an attack. Say, a, you know, a three cost card might attack for four damage, but it might give you six healing if you were buying one that had healing instead of attack. So it, it makes the healing pretty appealing. And there's one faction that actually focuses on that. They're the only faction you can normally get healing through. And that's, yeah, that's the blue faction. Which is pretty cool. That's a neat little strategy that you can take too. And and if you don't want to go that route, but you do still want some protection, one of the other neat things that this game offers is that some of the cards in the trade row aren't just cards that go into your deck and you play them and then you discard them at the end of your turn. They actually stay out after you play them from turn to turn. So those are called bases. And there are two kinds of bases. One are just normal, normal bases, I guess, and the other are outposts. And if you were playing a multiplayer game, if you had a base out. Uh, that's something that can just give you extra attack or extra buy power every turn. And your opponent might want to destroy that because that's not great for them, you know, if you have it out and keep benefiting from it. But if you have an outpost, it also does those things and gives you those benefits. Only if you're playing a multiplayer game, your opponent has to destroy that outpost before they can start attacking you directly. And that actually works out in the solo game as well. It works out great because not only do, do the outposts act as a shield, like we said earlier, this is just cards. There's no damage counters that you're dropping on those. If on a single turn, somebody can't blow up one of your outposts, then it's still full health next turn. They got to punch through every bit of that health again. And so there's, there's some real staying power in some of those bases. They add a really nice defensive element. And you don't have to use them in every scenario, but they're really nice if you did decide to put out some of those and create like a wall of, of bases around yourself. Now, they're a little rarer in the trade row, so you won't see as many of them. Some factions have more than others. The the Machine Cult, the Red Faction, and the, the Yellow Cult, the uh, Star Empire, have more bases than the others. But there are some of these scenarios that I think you can't really beat without them. One of the ones you said you couldn't beat without, I, I did manage to, but it sure does make a difference. It makes a big difference. In fact, uh, this is a good time for us to switch into talking about some of the scenarios. But one of the first ones that I played was called the Blob Assault, which is basically where you construct a deck. Uh, you take all the blob cards out of the trade deck and you put them in a single deck in the order that the rulebook tells you. So you know which order these cards are coming out. And the idea is that your army or whatever has ticked off the blob empire and they're coming for you and you need to withstand their assault. And if you withstand their assault all the way until they run out of cards in their deck, that's a minor victory. If you can actually defeat them before they destroy you, that's a major victory. And that is pretty sweet because you are just getting pounded from round to round because the blobs are murder machines. They just crank out combat like you wouldn't believe. And so being able to put out bases and outposts, especially outposts, makes all the difference in your survivability. Because if they can't destroy your outposts, you're not taking any damage for that round. And not taking damage for a whole round in a solo scenario is huge. It's, it's that tempo change that you need to actually win the scenario. Absolutely. I can't speak super well to this particular scenario like you said i had the kickstarter version which meant that a good 50 percent or so of my deck were promos and i just really didn't want to sort everything out it was going to be a lot of sorting and so i i skipped the four scenarios that had a particular faction emphasis 
and only played the ones that were just kind of whole deck scenarios. Yeah, and as somebody who has the retail edition of this game, I didn't find it that big a deal because there are a lot fewer cards. It doesn't take that long to sort out those cards and to set it up. And the nice thing that we haven't mentioned so far about this game is that it takes about 20 minutes to play. Oh, yeah, it's great. So once you've got that deck set up, you can, with a few modifications at the end of your game, set it right back up again and play again. I have played in one sitting six games at a time. Now, I recognize that for some people that might be a little ridiculous, but even six games, I mean, you're talking two hours. Yeah, and that's one of the things I I love about Star Realms as a multiplayer game is because of the short play time, you play it, you win, you lose, you shuffle up, you play again. I don't feel as committed, but that makes it, that's one of the things I love about the experience. Yeah, I, I agree. And on top of that, managing what happens on the AI's turn, if it's fair to call that, on the game's turn, is simple, if you can understand the rules for it. I mean, there's there's not actually that much to do to upkeep for their turn, and so you can very quickly play your turn, do what they need to do, and get right back to your turn, which is something that I highly value in a solo game. There are way too many solo experiences out there, especially war games. I'm going to pick real heavy on GMT right now. They're a great company, and they make some great games. But their solo experience, it always takes me two to three times as long to play the enemy's turn as it does to play my own. And that's not fun. I wouldn't do it. No, I don't either now. But I like to have agency in my game. That's why I play a game instead of watching a movie or something like that. I, I like the interactivity and the ability to make choices. What I really love about Star Realms is it gets out of its own way and lets you have fun without managing a bunch of stuff on the AI's turn. Yeah, I agree. I use uh, an app on my phone to track damage and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hit two or three buttons and then I get back to my turn. And I don't use the app and I still find it super simple. Which is a huge difference between Star Realms Frontiers and any other copy of Star Realms. It was awful. I played on the app when Star Realms, the original, first came out because it's a free app, or at least it was. If You might want to check the app store because it's it, a great deal. Yeah, the baseline of it was free, but the uh, no, the, the old decks had these other deck sections where you had one-point cards, and if you flipped it over, it was five-point cards, and so you had just mountains of cards that you were trying to use and keep flipping and trading out for other cards to keep up with authority. They have streamlined all of that down to a simple two card system. You got your tens digit, you got your ones digit, you slide the cards around, it shows what the authority is. It's beautiful. It's clean. I started doing the app thing back in the old card decks. If I started with with this box, I think I would just use what's in the box. Oh, yeah. The, the, what's in this box is so simple for managing your health on your turn and in between turns. And some AI scenarios are more complicated to run than others. So the one that Will referenced earlier, my first one that I played was the automatons scenario. And it's a cool idea in that you attack this enemy planet And suddenly it's like all the machinery on the planet wakes up and then starts going out and uh, taking control of all other vessels that it runs into in the galaxy. It just it's that like nano machine swarm just taking over everything. Yeah, thematically, it's real cool. Yeah. And thematically, it does come through in the game because every round you're sort of marking on a piece of paper off to the side. Uh, the strength of the automatons, which goes up by one every round. And the higher that number goes, so the longer your game goes. The more powerful it gets, the more cards it can play on its turn, and it gets out of hand real fast. It's much more complicated to play on their turn than in other scenarios. Now, that said, in my opinion, it's still not too complicated. I still really had a good time with it, but you had a different experience. I gave up on that one. Like I said, I, I'm not a solo gamer. I wasn't I wasn't having fun because I was cycling between those three rule books. It's what we were complaining about earlier. I shuffled up and then played the dimensional horror variant because I wanted to know whether I was going to enjoy any of this, whether I should just go back to playing something else. I loved the dimensional horror variant. I, I, I played it like four times. I am so in agreement here. This is one of the coolest scenarios I've played in any solo board game ever 
The reason for that is the dimensional horror on the card artwork is like a big hole, like a warp gate that has this horrible Cthulhu-esque thing breaking through it with tentacles that are coming out of the wormhole. And the way this works out mechanically in the game is you're going to draw, what, 10 cards at the beginning of the game randomly, and you're going to look at the color of their faction, and you're going to group all the yellow cards together, all the red together, all the green, and you're going to set them out as on the table so that they look like four tentacles coming off of the Dimensional Horror main card. And your goal is to, like, blast the cards in the tentacle, defeat each individual card by defeating its purchase cost each each section of the tentacle starts working like bases that we talked about before if you can beat that value you can blow it up if you can't you basically do no damage and it's so cool because every round it's going to add the last card in the trade row to one of its tentacles so you can see what color is coming up next and whatever color goes into the dimensional horror triggers a special ability for the horror that round and they're all bad, but some of them are worse than others. And you can manage which ones go in there by like trying to purchase ones that might go into the dimensional horror or mulliganing the train row if you really need to. I liked the fact that you could manage it, but you could never completely manage it. With the way the trade row works, as soon as you buy a card, you flip a new card out into that trade row. So if you buy the card in that fifth slot because you know that would be real, real bad for you, you don't know what's coming out because a new card is coming out immediately. And it's a blind card. It's a blind draw for you. Um, so you're always taking a bit of a gamble because it might actually be something worse than what you just got rid of. I love the fact that if it's early in the trade row and you know you don't want them to get it, and then you have some time to kind of prep and and work on getting rid of that card before it gets to them. But I also love the fact that you can't guarantee that you can get rid of all the bad stuff and control the flow of everything. You can never dictate it. There's just enough randomness to make sure that you you can never dictate the flow. And not only that, when you put a card from the end of the trade row into the tentacle... Then you're going to draw the top card of the trade deck. So a totally unknown card to you. And if it's the same color as the one you just added, it also goes in. And that can keep happening. So in theory, you could have a ton of cards that are added to one tentacle in one round. Now that statistically, that's not going to happen, right? And in my games, I never had more than three added at one time. And that was pretty rare. But it adds an element of uncertainty and... It's also just such a really cool thematic way to represent a tentacle horror by making these things grow on the table and regenerate on the table. So you need to blast them all the way down to win. And what Will mentioned with the randomness of what's going to happen on the AI's turn, that's something that cuts across all these scenarios. For the most part, what happens on the AI's turn isn't really that predictable, or at least it's never entirely predictable. And for me, if this was a 45 minute or an hour long game, I would hate that. I mean, I really want to be able to plan and and play against what's happening because when I'm playing a multiplayer game, I can do that. I can sort of read across the table. I don't have perfect information, but I have a general idea of what somebody's going to do in this It doesn't bother me because this is a 20 minute game. It's not like I'm ever investing that much in one play session. And yeah, I mean, if you get really hosed by the cards, which I definitely did. Oh, it can happen quickly. It happened real quick. Yeah. One of the defining characteristics of Star Realms to me is it, it ramps up. And once it starts ramping up, it gets real swingy, real fast. And I feel like that that particular feel stayed true in the in the solo variant from the the multiplayer. Yeah, and there are official difficulty tiers in the rule book. And yeah, that, that was nice. And that is really nice. And it's great that the game sort of grows with your ability as time goes by. But they're also not totally an accurate representation of how hard the game is going to be for you because I've had some intermediate level games that were not easy, but they were totally manageable. And other games that were real hard. Oh, yeah. Some of that variance of what's going to come up in the trade row really, really changes the difficulty 
But like I said, like you said, 20 minute game. That's one of the great things about it. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, if this was an hour long game, I wouldn't like that at all. But oh, no, be- I, I wouldn't play it. Well, no, but because it's 20 minutes, what it I'll ends play, up feeling- I'll play three and I'll play it for an hour. Yeah, and you'll get you'll get a game that balances out. And in the meantime, what it feels like as somebody playing it, it feels dynamic and action packed. And honestly, that element of the game- sucked me in way more than i expected it feels like a fight for your life when you're fighting against the dimensional horror oh absolutely this is one of those games that has grabbed me in a way that i didn't expect and in a way that's totally not in keeping with its price point or what i expect from games at this price point i guess there's a lot going on here and each of these plays very differently like radically differently from one another That adds to the replayability of the game, which is something we always try to talk about. Uh, I mean, you've got a quick setup time, so the game is replayable in that sense. You know, you can you can play it over and over and over and get a lot of play out of it there. But also from game to game, it's going to feel very different because the trade row is going to be very different at any given time. So the order that cards come out is different. And also just the way that each scenario plays is crazy different. Oh, yeah. I played the Pirates of the Dark Star and the Nemesis Beast scenarios, and the rules for them are super, super simple. But the pacing of the play on the two felt very different to me. It was one of those things where I expected them to feel really similar because on the cards, they're really similar, but they didn't feel similar once I was playing them. No, and after you've played one of these scenarios... It's very replayable. Each one on its own is very replayable. Absolutely. Like I said, the dimensional horror ended up being my favorite. And I played it, I think, four times, which was a lot, a lot for me. Oh, yeah. I played it several times as well. And folks, I'm just going to say right now, this is one of the best values in gaming. And that's what I'm going to say to start out our discussion of the good and the bad and the ugly. I paid $14.99 for this game. I started playing it a week ago. It is my most played game this year in terms of number of games that I have played because I can sit down at the end of a long day when I don't have the energy for a Mage Knight or a Feast for Odin or some of those other bigger games and I can crank out some of these and I have fun. I don't take very long setting it up. I don't exercise a lot of brain power in keeping up the AI's turn. And yet when I finish, I feel like I have played a game. A full, real game. And that is something really rare and special in this hobby, in my opinion. So the ratio of price point and rules entry cost and all the other costs that are associated with playing a game on top of what you pay monetarily, you know, the time you invest in the rules, the time you invest at the table, to the depth and the enjoyment is outstanding. This is one of the best values in gaming, period. And that's just... To start, I mean, I would say the number of scenarios in the box, how different they feel, right? I mean, it's all good stuff. The uh, One of the other good points for me is that this is the third entry in a larger series. And so if, if this works for you, you can just keep building into it. I like learning a rule set and then kind of investing into a game sometimes. I don't always want to learn a new game every time. There's room to invest deeper into Star Realms If it's something that you love. Yeah, and it's not immediately apparent that all the expansions that exist for this game would be compatible with the solo mode, but I do have some good news on that front. One of the cool things that's been added to Star Realms with this latest update is the introduction of Commander Packs into this game. And Commander Packs, if you're familiar with Hero Realms at all, are similar to the Hero Packs that came out for that game, where it gives you a different, unique deck Uh, for your start of the game so if you're playing a multiplayer game suddenly you've got an asymmetric start yeah each one of the commander decks starts with an emphasis on two of the four factions so there's one for every possible combination and then there's also a gray commander deck and the way they're balanced the the thought process behind it is each one of those decks is kind of at the strength level of two normal decks. So you're a lot stronger starting out. Yeah, and there are no rules for this in the rule book for how it would work solo. So I sent a message to White Wizard Games just to ask them, you know, 
if it was possible to play the commander decks with the solo scenarios. And they wrote me back saying that they would write up some rules for this and post them on their blog on their website. So now if they actually come out and do that, and I expect they will because the rep was very friendly and I want to believe that they will, that adds even more replayability to the game. But You know, even if you didn't have the commander packs, if you just wanted to go out and buy Colony Wars or you wanted to go out and buy the Star Realms base set, I could see those integrating very well. Uh, I think they would, yeah. Really, the only downsides to that would be storage because the boxes that you've got aren't going to be big enough to hold all those cards. They do sell a real big storage box, but... Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah, because it's a, a game that is kind of modular. That makes sense. So you could store them in one of those special boxes if you wanted to. The other downside might be if you want to play one of these faction specific scenarios, the more cards you buy for this game, the longer it's going to take to set up and weed out all the cards that you need. Like I said, that's why I didn't. That's why I didn't. But if you just have the base set, I'm telling you, there's a ton, a ton of replayability in this box. And you can just know that down the road, if you don't mind a longer setup time, there's room for expansion there. Yeah. As for things that are bad about this game, I don't really have that much to say here. I'm going to put the rules organization in the bad category. It's borderline ugly for me. I would have put it in ugly, but like I said, I'm not, I'm not experienced with how much you really kind of invest into the differences in the rules with solo games either. Here's why I would put it in bad instead of ugly for me. And again, it's pretty borderline. It's not good. For sure, but I was able to grasp the rules for the scenario after one play, even though it was more difficult than I would like and it took more flipping back and forth than I would like. And after that, I didn't really have any trouble. And so for me, that's what keeps it from tipping over into the ugly category. The rules are still overall simple enough that I can get it. I wish that they were all in the rule book and then I just had a recap on the card, but you know, say la vie. It doesn't ruin the game for me. And that's, for me, the only real negative thing I could say for me personally. For a lot of people, I would say the the swinginess and the randomness of the AI's turn, which is normally something I would hate. I think a lot of people are still not going to love that part. For me, it doesn't bother me because, again, 20-minute game. Yeah, to me, it's just part of the Star Realms experience. That that swinginess is, is, is part of what makes it fun. It creates a lot of tension. And so, for me, there's nothing ugly about this game the rules are the only bad thing you have anything that you want to add here no that was really the only negative in the whole experience for me was the frustration of the organization of the rules it's not even the rules themselves it was how they were how they were put together well that means then that we come to the end where we talk about whether this game gets the Solosaurus stomp of approval. And even though Carter is not here, we have vested Will with all the power and authority that Carter has. And in case you're not familiar with the Solosaurus stomp of approval is, that is an award that we give to games that both hosts feel like is a great value and totally worth picking up for solo play, even if that's the only way you ever play this game. We're looking for games in a very crowded market that stand out as something that are replayable and that we just love playing. And of all the games that we've reviewed so far, only five of those have ever gotten a stomp of approval. So we try to keep that selection pretty lean. We're very serious about being hard on games because we want people to be able to make an informed decision and we want the cream to rise to the top. And so do you think this is a stomp of approval worthy game? For me, I would give it the stomp. And and the biggest reason is... Even though you just told me Caverna has a solo variant, I'm not itching to dig it out of the box. This will hit the table for me again pretty soon. I I will keep playing this. I might even try to teach this to my dad because he's a Klondike player. He's not a board gamer. But this, I think he'd like. Oh yeah, this is simple. You can play it with other people. But even if you didn't play it with other people, even if you only played it solo, you still feel like it's worth the Oh, no, I'm saying I might try and teach him the solo variant. Oh, Because like I said, he's a Klondike player. I see. He's a like old school solitaire, you know, 52 card deck sort of sort of guy. Wow. I and I have to agree. I think this is a tremendous value for $15. If you looked at just the components that are in the box, 
it just looks like a stack of cards and you would totally be right if you said, what about this is worth $15? But games are always more than what's in the box. And in this case, I think that what's in this box, simply by the fact that you have eight different scenarios that play radically different from one another, that will play radically different from game to game, and that provide you with a really satisfying, engaging experience, it's just tremendous. And at $19.99 for the MSRP, if you like deck building games at all, and personally, I have sort of thought for a while that I'm over deck building as a genre. I like deck building when it's an add-on to other games now, but as far as pure deck builders are concerned, I've played so many that they have to do a lot to impress me. This impresses me. This is fantastic. So if you have not tried out Star Realms before because it's always been multiplayer oriented, Star Realms Frontiers is a great entry point for you, and it is totally worth picking up even if you only ever play it solo. As someone who is is just getting into solo games, it got me in. And I'll see where I go from here, but but I'll keep playing this one for sure. And that says everything. This game is getting the Solosaurus stomp of approval. Thank you all so much for listening to the show. If you haven't yet, please follow us on Facebook or Instagram, where you can find us at at Solosaurus Podcast. You can see pictures of everything that we've been playing recently and follow us there to see what's just arrived at our house and, and see some unboxing pictures and things like that. We would love to share those things with you. If you haven't yet, send us an email. If you have a question or comment about the show, you can email us at solosauruspodcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't yet, please go onto iTunes, find the show, and rate us or review us. I know that that sounds like a very small thing, but it's actually a very big thing. It helps people to find the show and to know that we exist. So go on there and give us a, a review. One more thing, if you haven't yet, Go on to Board Game Geek and you can buy yourself a micro badge that shows that you love Solosaurus. If you don't have the eight geek gold that it takes to buy the Solosaurus badge, send me a message on there. You can search me in the user database and I will spot you the geek gold that you need to get it for yourself because we want to see more people out there with the badge. And until next time, a big thanks to Will for coming on to the show. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks for having me. And until next time, I'm Brandon Waite. And I'm Will Hedrick. And this is Solosaurus. Solosaurus.